we are going to cover a lot of um, build up to uh, the individual herbs, but it's just all of the things involving herbs. Um, we want to, um, can we advance? Sorry. Okay. Just what head is an, uh, an herb? There's um, a lot of, you know, herbs are used in uh, um, food and in medicine, things that we um, just, just don't even think of. And it's any plant with uh, the leaves and seeds and flowers. But do you know how to pronounce H-E-R-B? Um, it is... It's, it's real funny because it, um, it kind of depends on um, where you're from. Now, in the United States, we do not um, pronounce the H. It's an it's herb. But if uh, the, the English and British influence countries do pronounce it, and it's herbs. So that's just a little... Not that it makes a big difference, but uh, you, you can still get the, the value of these plants. Um, do you know the difference between an herb and a spice? Um, actually, uh, herbs and spices, sometimes they can come from um, the same plant, but it's different parts of the plant. I guess I don't have to gesture because you can't see me. Um, it is the, um, an herb is the green leafy part of the plant. And the spices come from the roots, the stems, the seeds, uh, the fruit, the flower, the bark. Um, sometimes uh, one plant can provide a spice and an herb, like cilantro, dill, fennel, uh, peppercorns are considered fruit, um, and they come from vines. So um, it, it's just, you know, we have wonderful little plants that can give us everything. Now, why would you want to grow herbs? Well, that's, you know, depends on what you want to use it for. Um, of course, they don't take up much space, and we'll get to the, um, the like, the how you can uh, grow them, you have a choice of what you want to grow them in, but they can be used in um, uh, to cook with. And down here it says aromatherapy. Well, I like to include both of those, the culinary uses and the aromatherapy, because I just love to smell the herbs when they're cooking. Um, uh, it, there's um, evidence dating, dating back to, um, oh, about 60,000 years ago uh, that the Neanderthals, 85% um, of the population employ um, herbs as medicine. 40% um, of pharmaceuticals in the U.S. contain plant-derived materials, which is I've always said that um, a lot of our medications are just kind of purified um, versions of using herbs and spices to um, for our medical needs. Um, fewer than 10% um, of higher plant species have been investigated for their medicinal components. Um, uh, interest in traditional herbal uh, remedies continue to grow. That's what well, we have herbalist. Uh, we have um, not too far from here, we have actually little pharmacies, but they're, they're herbal pharmacies and they will, uh, depending on what your symptoms are, they can mix up a tea or a salve or, you know, and it's, it doesn't come with a prescription, but, um, we can, uh, we're not going to endorse any of the, um, the health and medicinal benefits of herbs and spices just because um, 
there's no actually proven, um, well, everybody's different and you can react to the, the different herbs in different ways. Um, a lot of people with all of this, uh, the, the uses of the herbs, um, a lot of people will put plants like in a walkway just so that they can walk by and brush it. Rosemary's wonderful with it. Go by and just kind of brush it. And then you have this aromatherapy all over your yard. Now, if you're gonna grow um, herbs, there are a lot of things to consider. And we'll talk about each one of these topics, but you need to decide what would be um, like the best place for you to um, uh, lay out your herb garden. You wanna plan the layout according to a lot of different things. You, there's a, a soil preparation and fertilization, mulch, watering, um, different herbs require different uh, um, watering methods, your pest control, and then we'll talk about harvesting and preserving. Um, here's a little, a little saying that um, if you eat the fruit or the root, it needs full sun. If you eat the leaves, some shades will do. So um, that's kind of a little, a little guess on how you can um, how you can judge where to where to put them, and you can plan out your little bed, your site location. Um, you want to plant them high so they'll have good drainage. Um, and depending on which one of your your herbs that you're considering the sun and shade requirements need to be um, considered also. Um, and where the sun is all during the day, you know, where does it, where is, uh, does it dawn? Where does it set? Um, and most herbs will require about six hours of, of sun. Um, in this picture, we're not sure uh, the position of the sun because it, and you can't tell by the shadows because they're just kind of permanently there. Um, you want to be aware of where the sun is, like I said, and you want to um, plant the, the larger, taller plants kind of in the back or in the center of a, of a big ground bed so that it doesn't shade the, um, some of the others. Evening sun is the hottest and you also wanna protect them from that. Some herbs benefit from less evening sun. I, I, if I were an herb, I would want to avoid the evening sun. Um, you wanna consider the layout of your, of your garden. And like I said, you wanna plant the taller ones, um, kind of in the, like these little beds are, are squares you will have the, um, the larger ones in the middle so that the, the smaller ones or lower ones can actually uh, benefit from the sun circulation. Um, part of the layout is like, how are you gonna harvest these? Are you gonna be able to um, get to them easily? You know, that's why a lot of people have their their beds in kind of a, a, a U shape so that they can get on both sides of the bed. Um, and uh, you wanna know if it's tall or if it's gonna spread the growth habits of the different ones and uh, you know to consider during your layout. Now, when I said the growth habits, if you'll see right this very bottom circular one um, these are, some plants can be considered invasive, but if you know that it's invasive, you can also kind of control it, uh, corral it. Um, some will just spread like crazy, like um, um, mint just goes everywhere. So we have shown a picture of where you um, bury it's either like a rim of a pot or you can bury the pot with the bottom out and it kind of controls the mints, um, the whatever is invasive. 
um, just, you know, figure out a way that is going to work for you. Um, now, here's another thing. You want to consider the, the different types of um, uh, where you want to plant them, where you want to display them. Usually, the, the kitchen herb garden will be right by your kitchen. So you can just step outside, snip what you need, and, and go back in and throw it in a pot. Um, just, you know, make it really convenient for you to use it. And this is multiple little small containers. Um, you have a, a choice. You can do it like that. You can put it in um, like a single large container if that's what you would like to do. These water troughs are really, really good. And if you'll see, there's my favorite there on the left, that Cuban oregano. Oh, you want that close to your close to your back door so you can brush by it and smell it all the time. Here is um, another one. You can do like a cluster of maybe even larger containers. Um, you can do hanging baskets. You can do like a, a planter box like was in the other one. Clay pots are good. You need, just need to be real careful with them because they will your plants will uh, uh, dry out quicker. It has a tendency to evaporate. You can do those, you know, those great big uh, uh, whiskey barrels, plant them in those concrete blocks, those cinder blocks in the little holes. We've even seen people put them in old boots. They're just, you, you just do what you, what you wanna do, what is best for, for you, excuse me. Um, here is um, a picture of our, our, we've got two herb beds out at the Discovery Garden. This one is the round bed, and we kind of redesigned it this past year so that, um, oh, it looked pretty, and we were able to put a whole lot of things. If you'll see, that is um, um, onion garlic, no, onion chives around this outside rim. And then we have taller, this is rosemary up close to the sundial because it would be taller. And then <clears throat> we had medium plants kind of in that middle row and little shorter plants in the, in the front. Um, we had, uh, uh, we just, I mean, redid it thanks to Brianna. We tilled everything up, and I mean, we just, I mean, got it down to the, to the bottom. Um, it was amended with some good soil and, and uh, compost. Um, you can also put a weed cloth or a barrier on there to, you know, like kill all the weeds. Um, the bricks were placed all around there. We had, um, uh, they were, just a, all the plants were arranged so that they would look pretty and they would be accessible to us. Um, and we had markers on all of them. Um, here is a picture of, actually, this is another choice you can have. This is a picture of the other herb bed that we had, um, we had out there at the garden. And there's five levels. Each one, actually, we treated this since it wasn't all together, we treated this as a themed herb garden. And each one of these were a different theme. Um, we had, um, a well, we had Tex-Mex on one end, this is the other end that you can't see, that we had, um, we had chives and cilantro and peppers. Peppers were the thriller. Um, <clears throat> and then we had filler and uh, um, spillers. We had another one um, that was, we considered a tea bed. And it is, it was um, uh, lemon balm, these mints that were, I, I personally love them, and sage. Then we had a uh, poultry seasoning was the, their very top one. 
um, and it was everything that you would use in a, a poultry seasoning bed, like uh, sage, marjoram, weeping rosemary, and that is beautiful. You can see it in that top bed. It's it's flowing over. It's just beautiful. Um, our tea bed had chamomile, mint, and we had stevia right in the middle of it because you want to sweeten your tea maybe. Um, and then we had, this last one was considered a gumbo bed because it had oregano and thyme. And then this is our bay laurel tree. Um, it, it, you know, those are just things you want to consider if you want to have, depends on what you, how, how you're going to use it. If you cook more Italian, then you can have one bed that's just Italian and it works real well. Um, then um, we want to have, um, we are going to go, there's your themed beds. Um, you, can, you can put whatever you want in there. Um, just so that it's a little bit easier for you to uh, use them. Okay, we want to consider the, uh, you know, the soil prep, just like we did with that big uh, round herb bed. Um, if, um, if you're doing it in the ground, you uh, sometimes the, um, if we have a lot of rain, which sometimes we do, then um, it washes out a lot of the nutrients from uh, sandy soil, which we're getting close to. So you might want to um, uh, amend it or, you know, do your compost in there. The clay pots, like I said, they, um, they have a tendency to uh, evaporate. You want to uh, till uh, peat or compost into heavier, heavier soil just so that you can make it a little bit lighter and it'll be well draining. Um, if you have a raised bed, you want to do a really good soil mixture. Now, what I'm gonna say next is gonna be directly against what Dr. Johnson used to tell us about that there's a difference between soil and dirt. We didn't use the word dirt very often. He said, soil is what you plant in. Dirt is what you get under your fingernails. Um, but there is, um, on the internet, you can look up like a dirt calculator and uh, find out how much soil you need. You know, you've already planned out a certain space. How much soil you need for that space? And you can go to Google and it's just, uh, it's called a dirt calculator. Forgive us, Dr. Johnson. Um, or you can make your own mix. Um, uh, it's, in general, you don't need a real fancy mixture for herbs. And um, But commercial bags, they have organic additives like mulch. So just buyer beware. This is... Um, you can do this mix. It's a very good mix. Got the perlite in there to uh, uh, make it a little lighter. And um, you just, I mean, good topsoil and compost and peat uh, or humus just to make a real good combination. And it wouldn't be difficult to, um, to make this up. Um, then another thing you want to consider is your fertilizer. Uh, you can use a good balanced fertilizer for that. Some uh, bone meal is good uh, to um, add nitrogen. Uh, uh, bone meal is a good organic nutrient used to, uh, for flowers also. Um, if there is a recipe that we use in the greenhouse, but it's uh, best if you use it after like heavy rains. Like I said, if there's a heavy rain and it washes a lot of the nutrients out, you might want to mix this up. This is, we call this Mary's mix because Mary Gonzalez um, in the greenhouse came, um, this was her suggestion. This was her recipe, uh, but it's the Epsom salt, the Super Thrive, and a tablespoon of miracle Grow, and you spray it or put it in a, a watering can. 
very good. It's done real well for the plants in the greenhouse. Now, um, we're talking about mulch. We're just going down the line of things that you want to do. Um, you don't want to overdo it. You can use the mulch for, uh, for weed control. So like it says, it saves your back. I'm, I'm old enough that that is very important to me. Uh, you only want to use like three inches at the, at the max. It will uh, retain your moisture. It will keep your moisture in as long as you have that well-draining soil, but this will keep that moisture in there. And it will maintain temperatures, whether uh, you, know, you want to cool things off in the summer or keep them warm in the winter. Um, you don't want to mulch all the way up to um, the base of the plant because it needs um, air circulation. That's important for uh, especially the Mediterranean and they like a drier climate. Now, what kind of mulches do you, we have a choice of? Um, you can use paper or newspaper. The ink is not... Um, a, a toxic anymore. And so you can use the newspaper. Wood chips and bark. Um, we just be careful if you also have animals, they may eat the, um, the wood chips and it is not pleasant um, as it works through the system. Or you can do a landscape cloth. Um, that does real well to keep the, um, um, oh, help me here. The um, weeds out. Now, about watering, it depends on what um, what herbs you have. Like the Mediterranean uh, plants, just really don't like. Um, just keep it evenly moist. They don't like the wet feet. Um, and be careful with the containers. Like I said, with the um, terracotta pots, they can they can dry out too quickly. You want to early uh, water early in the morning, uh, but wait until after all of the the um, the dew has uh, uh, your transpiration. It has kind of evaporated. Um, it, you know. Um, most of the time, you know how our weather is. It can be drastic in the summers. And so a lot of these, a lot of these herbs need to be watered every day. Not a lot, but just every day. Um, you can use timers with a, a drip irrigation. Um, and certainly you could have more control over, over the watering. Now, um, with the pest controls, uh, ladybugs, the parasite wasps, praying mantis, toads and frog spiders, they're natural predators. You can use some soapy water on uh, the not so great ones that you don't want on there because it will, um, uh, you want to use the like Dawn and um, uh, diluted real well. You can apply it and then rinse, uh, rinse it with water. Um, it washes the insects and soap away. This will help control aphids and spider mites and threats. Um, on the harvesting, oh, if you have, if you see ladybugs on your plants, it is an indication, now they're good ones, but it is an indication they eat aphids. And so uh, you can rest assured that you're going to have aphids in there if you see your ladybugs. You can, and when I talked about the soapy water mix, um, it breaks down the waxy outer shell on these insects and they, they go away. Now harvesting, when you can do this all season, um, you can go and pinch it back and use, use your herbs, but as you're pinching it back, have a, have a recipe in mind or a, um, uh, oh, um, just kind of plan it out. But as you go through and you're kind of pinching it back, just remember that um, you don't want to do more than a third of the mature plant. That any more is going to kind of hurt it maybe a little bit. 
you want to uh, harvest the herbs in the morning uh, and kind of plant it. It's after the dew has disappeared, but before the hot sun is out there. Then as you harvest them, you want to wrap it in a, um, a paper towel, a wet paper towel, and put it in the refrigerator until you're ready to use it. But use it soon. Um, Mary Demony is one of our, our master gardeners, and she pointed out that in her kitchen garden program that harvesting and preserving can be the hardest part of the gardening because the rest of it is pretty easy. You just need to watch them. Now, preserving, there are several kinds of ways that, that you can do that. You know, of course, you can absolutely use it right then, but if you are... Um, harvesting and you kind of get ahead, you're going to plan out how the different ways that you can uh, preserve it. Like you can dry them in a low, slow oven uh, or hang them upside down. Um, we, you can also freeze them. There are places to freeze. And then um, in oil, like in a, a chimichurri or pesto. Now with drying, you can do the um, you know, the air drying, just get a bundle and hang it upside down in a, you know, in a dark, dust-free um, area. You can cover it with a paper bag if, uh, there, if you want to keep the, the dust out. Um, and that will take about one to two weeks. Now, you can do the um, oven drying, the dehydrator. <clears throat> you can separate the leaves and put them on a cookie sheet. But then you want to do low heat, like 95. Um, and then you just want to monitor it so you don't monitor it so you don't char them, which is my my specialty. Um, or you want to seal it in a well sealed glass container, wall jar, away from the heat and the light. Um, if you if you have a, a with the um, the oven drying, if you have a gas oven, the sometimes the pilot light is enough. Um, heat for you to do the drying overnight. So that's something to consider. Now, freezing. The um, herbs can become uh, limp and loose colored. Uh, you can put them in a freezer bag and, or a plastic container. You can chop them or you can put them whole and put them in there. Uh, you can freeze mint uh, or uh, the uh, herb in, ice cubes and uh, put them in your refrigerator. Uh, my neighbor, does, she just goes ahead and makes up her pesto and, you know, like when she has different herbs and then she puts it in her ice cubes and then when she can use it in a dish, she just pops out that, that ice cube of pesto and, and it just makes her, makes her recipe even better. Um, most all of these um, you are good for about a year. Now, the oil res uh, preservation, um, you can use, uh, you can save it in an oil. You want to place the herbs in a food processor and go ahead and chop them up. And about a third of a cup of the oil for every two cups of the leaves or a half a cup of unsalted butter with uh, for two to four tablespoons of leaves. That um, makes wonderful spread. Um, the butter, butter preparation can, you can store it safely in the refrigerator for up to one week. That's safe. Now, um, if you wanna push it a little farther, then I didn't say you could. Um, they can, the oil preparation can be stored in the refrigerator for about six months. I think that we're going to be using them for uh, quicker than that. You'll just have to make up some more. Now, um, this is um, the the plant selections for zone nine. We are we are nine. Um, we are lucky to be gardeners in this zone because you know the growing conditions, except for our little cold snap the other day, um, are. It nearly perfect for most of the year uh, for every herb. Um, they thrive in warm temperatures, which we definitely have. Uh, four to six hours of bright sunlight a day, The uh, definitely the morning sunlight uh, with a little protection in the afternoon. 
But these are all of the, the um, herbs that we know grow well in our area. Um, there's um, a handout of the ones who grow well in Galveston County. Um, look at, um, we may have some later programs on propagating herbs. Um, and I am going to turn it over to Brianna now. Gardening is something you learn by doing and by mistakes. Like cooking, gardening is a constant process of experimentation, repeating the success and throwing out the failures. I've thrown out a lot of the failures. Dishes and So I would like to share with you my experiences with herbs, growing them and cooking with them. I've had plenty of the failures. So we're gonna start with cool season annual herbs. Here's a few that are, will be in the list of plants. Timing is important with planting. So um, most cool uh, season herbs can tolerate normal freezes, but um, this last freeze has caused catastrophe in my garden. But there are some, I'm gonna point out the ones that did make it. Arugula. So I'm trying to give you plant information that's consistent and there will be there will be a handout. So you can uh, print this out to keep for your records. Um, when we're in um, in-person things, it's usually a, a printout that we hand out, but you should be able to refer to this in the future. Um, Uh, this plant works really well as a, a lettuce substitute. It um, has a spicy flavor. It's very easy to grow. It will bolt in the when it gets warm, so it's best to plant this when it's cold in the uh, fall. The cool season annual, and it only it's only an annual. It will not last for the next year. When it bolts, it's the it's the end of its time. It's not a perennial. Cutting celery. This, this plant is also known as um, herb leaf celery. It's the same plant. It's an annual. Tastes just like celery. It's an easy way to get that celery flavor into your dishes without those picky eaters uh, moving those celery out. My kids used to do that. Okay, and it does not stalk like celery. It's just leaves. Cilantro or coriander or and coriander. Cilantro is the leaf and coriander is the seed. Um, this is another cool season annual. It, you start it in, when it's in the fall, it's the best. We, we like to have it with our tomatoes for salsa. You can grow up in the spring. Uh, it's just not going to last through the summer. Our Texas heats, our Texas heat will make it bolt and go to seed. And if you want the coriander seed, that's great. But uh, another way to prevent that from happening is to keep it in a pot or um, keep it in the evening from the evening shade. Will make it last longer. There are slow bolt varieties, we sell one. Um, there'll be at our sale online, but um, definitely uh, coriander, there it is. Coriander is one of the ingredients for a pickling spice, the seed. German chamomile. This is one of the ones that was in our tea bed. There are two types of chamomile cultivated and sold widely 
in the US, English and, some, and sometimes we refer to the Russian or the Roman and German chamomile, which grows best in our area. It likes the benefit from shade as well. Um, when it gets real hot, if you, uh, it's best to keep the soil evenly moist because when it gets really hot, it'll start to uh, go into dormant, dormancy. It's more of a cool season annual. And it will recede easily. So be aware of that. If you don't like plants that recede, you'll have to be diligent in, in removing the flowers. Bill, I like planting this as a trap crop for my tomatoes. It brings in uh, beneficial insects that um, get rid of those tomato hornworms that will attack them like the parasitic wasps. But it is also a black swallowtail host. This is a reseeding plant too. If you don't like reseeders, be careful. You'll have to be diligent about cutting these flowers the umbrellas. Um, if you, if you're harvesting this before um, your cucumbers are ready, you can put the whole umbrella in the uh, freezer in a bag. It works really well. Bill is a biannual, and it is very sensitive to, to light freezes and frosts. It is technically uh, a perennial, but it. it uh, usually used as a single use plant because of, the, of when it blooms, it's done. And dill, dill seed is also used in pickling spice. So this is one of those ones that are two parts, the leaf and the seed. Garden soil, I don't have a lot of experience with this plant but it tastes good. I've tasted it and I like it. So sorrel gro grows in clumps, much like the arugula. It, I would use it on a sandwich like a arugula. It has a lemony flavor. And the young tender leaves are the most desirable and it's a cool season perennial as well. It, but most of the times it's grown as a, a annual because it doesn't like the heat. When it, our heat will make these um, herbs bolt and uh, many times the um, after the the herb bolts, the leaves become bitter on many many herbs: herb parsley, cilantro, garden soil. Name a few. Here's the the uh, flower. So now, cool season perennials. Fall is the best time to plant just about anything in Texas. Shrubs and perennials are best planted in fall. So they grow through our mild winters and more established when it gets hot. Plant, plant, root, plant roots grow whenever the temperature is about 40 degrees. The ground does not freeze in our area. I know that for sure now because of our last winter storm, Uri. Um, I believe our, um, we recorded, the lowest temperature we recorded was 58 degrees in a raised bed, a bed 40 in the Discovery Garden. Okay, and so let me say, I've seen parsley has made it, uh, as the sage never even turned brown. The sage stayed green the entire Time. It never turned brown with all that freeze. And uh, our rosemary, I think, is going to make it. It doesn't look good. It's going to have to be cut back severely. But when I go to look at it, I can see that it's going to make it. So first, I'll talk about bay laurel. This is another one that made it. It looks, someone uh, came to the garden was like, what is that tree? And they were pointing to the bay laurel because it was almost the only green thing still in the discovery garden. Bay laurel is it. It's a beautiful, big, um, it gets big, column like shrub tree, sub shrub, or sub small tree. There we go. 
and um, it's drought tolerant. You don't have to, after established, like after the first year, Laurel always says water it well for the first year. But um, after that, it becomes, you don't have to have um, uh, the word. Irrigation on it. You don't need, to, it doesn't need irrigation. In the discovery garden, it doesn't have irrigation in it. Anyway. Um, bay leaves, we use them for gumbo, and they propel weevils in the pantry. You can just put a cut a branch, put a branch of dry leaves in your in your pantry, and it helps repel weevils. Garlic chives, onion chives have round stems, and garlic chives have flat stems. This is one of our plants that we used in our a Tex-Mex bed. And uh, the garlic chives are more um, cold tolerant, no, more drought tolerant and heat tolerant than onion chives. Onion chives were um, introduced by Marco Polo to the Europe and Chinese, and chi the ch Chinese onion chives from the Chinese. Onion chives have a tender, thinner stem with pom-pom type flower head. Our heat can stress out this herb. If you keep it in even moisture and maybe some shade, you will have lush chives all year round. Fennel. Okay. This is herb fennel, bronze fennel. It also uh, attracts the black swallowtail butterfly, the, the um, caterpillar. It's a host plant for them. It eats the leaves. So you plant enough to share. It is. It gets really big, so one plant will do. It can get four to five feet in height. Um, that's a lot of growing in one season, so um, more than likely, if you're trimming from it, it won't get that tall. If you're using it, it won't get that tall. And uh, if you let it go to seed, fennel seed is, is a spice used in sausage. Here's the bulb fennel. Um, we, this variety is a Florence fennel that we sell. There are varieties that are better for um, the bulb, if, you, if you're trying to reach the bulb. To get the bulb, you're gonna have to plant it in the um, fall. It, um, it will bolt during this, our hot summers and will not form the bulb. So if you want a bulb, plant it in the fall. Greek oregano mine made it. it. It has areas that it was, it has brown, but there's a lot of areas underneath that are green. Mine might be in a bit of a microclimate because it's right next to my house. That always matters. But um, this is a very cold tolerant plant. Now, um, Greek oregano is more pungent than like the Italian oregano or other um, marjoram, but um, I trim mine twice a year, May and August. And this is the one, as Nancy said, has to be controlled. It spreads and grows like a ground cover. So if that bothers you, maybe you want to plant this in a, in a uh, pot. Mine, I just let it go. Oh, and that's a Mediterranean herb, and Italian oregano is also a Mediterranean herb, but it's a milder version of Greek oregano. It's actually uh, called a wild marjoram. Flat parsley. Parsley is a biennial. It can li live at least two, two years old. Um, most cooks believe that after it flowers, it becomes bitter. So uh, many people don't allow it to grow for its second year. But um, 
Parsley attracts uh, black swallowtail butterflies. They'll lay their eggs and parsley caterpillars emerge and begin to eat your parsley. Plant more than one so you can share with our butterfly or caterpillars, I should say. Parsley can also benefit from evening shade. And um, chimpuris, this is what we were talking about, Nancy was talking about. Um, parsley and cilantro and mint, great chimpuri. Or add it to your pestos. It adds more green flavor to your, to your basil pestos. There's the flower. Curly parsley. This made this is more cold tolerant than the flat parsley. It it is still it doesn't it didn't even turn brown out there. In the in our herb garden, it's a survivor. Um, on Facebook, it was they were kind of coining the phrase unfazed. That's what they'd say. They'd take a picture of a plant that made it through the through the yuri the cold snap, and they called it unfazed. This is one that I could have. Put a picture next to unfazed. Um, usually it's a garnish and supposedly eating the garnish it would rid your rid you of the bad breath but um, parsley can be easily propagated from seed. I suggest soaking the seeds for one hour to overnight because it can be one of those slow to germinate and it's slow to grow at first as well. And I prefer the um, curly parsley parsley when uh, you need a fine chop for like sauces but the everyone, everyone always says the the um, flat leaf parsley is better for dishes rue this is an interesting plant i learned that rue in the 1500s and the 1600s it was placed in courtrooms to protect protect the magistrates from the prisoners it will also repel dogs and cats and Japanese beetles with its strong flower scent. And AgriLife suggests is planting it rose in rue in rose beds. It can produce a root chemical that repels Japanese beetle grubs. Japanese beetles, those are the, what we call them June bugs. And grub worms, you know, they, they, they will eat something that you don't want in our soil. But um, it, it is best pruned to control into a small edge because it can get two feet tall. It's best to keep it about one feet tall. Salad Burnett, this is a very, very pretty plant. I love this plant. It was sometimes used as an erosion control. It's easily started from seed with moderate mo moisture. It will germinate easy and fast. It thrives in well-draining soil. Salad burnet plant has a, a stems that rise from the basal rosette on the second year, it can grow um, the flowers. It will flower on the second year, there we are, and can grow to one feet tall. And the flowers of salad burnet are uh, not self-pollinating and must be pollinated by wind. In good conditions, the plant will form seeds in the fall. This plant will looks good grown in formal walkways. So if you want, this is like corn. If you um, want it to make fertile seeds, it will, you'll have to have a succession of, of plants because they can pollinate each other in the wind. And there's the flower. The flower is so cute. Texas tarragon, this is really most people call it Mexican mint marigold, but um, as Texans, we adopted Texas tarragon because we can't grow French tarragon, so we grow Texas tarragon. And it, it's a, it will bloom yellow flowers in the fall. It's beautiful. It's very hardy perennial. It will return in the spring from its roots because every one of our plants out there are brown. <laughs> but we can cut them back and it'll be, it'll come back. And pollinators love this plant, but those those blooms will appear in, in the fall. Let's see. It's the, in the fall. It's I think it starts blooming in September, October. Common thyme, the Mediterranean herb. 
there's common time, English time, French time. Common time and English time are the same thing, but French time has a subtle flavor, flavor and is also called summertime. So many times it's confusing. But they all have the same citrusy flavor. This, this plant gives me problems. It, um, it's one of those plants where if it gets too wet and then it gets dry, it doesn't like it. It doesn't like to, it doesn't like to dry out and then you water it. It doesn't respond well. Um, I have trouble keeping time alive. But uh, it likes, um, it likes well-draining soil and that's the biggest thing. And it's best to keep the uh, herb trim to prevent the woody stems. But here in Texas, they always get woody. I don't understand this. So some uh, evening shade will help with time. And German winter time is Madeline Hill's favorite. Um, uh, during, we, we, we used to sell German winter time. We don't have it this year, but it's a great plant. It's popular in French and Cajun dishes. Lemon thyme, it's a pretty plant, but I kill it in the season. Well, I don't have much to say about that one other than it's, it tastes good when I do have it and it's pretty. A winter savory, it's a Mediterranean herb and it adds that pepper flavor. Um, I've, I've heard it referred to as the bean uh, herb. Warm season herbs. So here we go, spring. I'm ready. So ready to get all the brown out and start planting new plants. Uh, thyme, sage, catmint, lemon, lavender are prone to root rot when the weather is hot. They require excellent drainage and plenty of space for air circulation. During our rainy season, harvest these herbs in the center to open them up, to give them air. Starting with African blue basil, the beautiful plant. It's a perennial basil. It can have uh, slugs and beetles will nimble on it, but using a sharp mulch will help discourage their approach and retain needed moisture. It's a good pesto or cooking basil. Add the fresh leaves at the end of preparations for your dishes to get the best basil flavor. Now, um, sweet basil or Genovese basil, they're both the same thing. It can be grown in a bright lit kitchen or a patio in spring or fall. Uh, best cultural practice, practices are to trim blooms and do not let them dry out. It will last till temperatures drop down to 50 degrees. It can easily reseed. I can grow basil in cracks of, of my uh, sidewalk. Um, but uh, it's easy to grow and sweet basil and Genovese are the same, as I said, and these are the ones that are preferred in fresh preparations like salads. Um, what is that salad? That's got basil and mozzarella. Caprizi salad, this is the best one for that. Um, there's a large leaf Italian basil that it looks much like this one with the, um, the leaves that, that curve down and um, the um, reason this, this, the leaves are thin and subtle, that makes, um, they're not as thick as the African blue basil. That's why this one is best for fresh preparation. And Mrs. Burns lemon basil has a lemony basil flavor. It smells so good. It's one of the ones you want growing just because you like the way it smells. It was an heirloom discovered in New Mexico. It's, uh, it's the best lemon basil. There is another lemon basil, but this is the best one, Mrs. Burns. Bee balm, also known as bergamot or Oswego tea. The leaves and the blooms can be put into a, a tea preparation 
You can dry the leaves and the, the flowers, or you can use them fresh. Uh, during the Boston Tea Party, American colonists enjoyed tea brewed from the Monarda plants, the bee, bee balm. There are dwarf varieties as well. Um, the um, native varieties are very tall, but the dwarf varieties can only will only reach 18 inches. Uh, it's best to cut it back at the end of July or August. It will grow back in, again and bloom. If you miss this, um, if you miss this window, to please trim, trim it back before winter. Hummingbirds, bees, and butterflies love this plant. I have hummingbirds come into mind and bumblebees. Forage. <clears throat> After planting your forage in early spring, its blooms will emerge in June and July. The, the uh, blooms hang downward in a facing in uh, downward facing clusters. But the flowers and the leaves of this plant are edible with a unique flavor similar to a cucumber without the burp. Catmint. Catmint is really easy to grow and it can be aggressive kind of like a mint or oregano. Bees love this. If you need to bring bees, if you want to bring some pollinators in, catmint. I mean, it's gorgeous. It's covered in flowers. Uh, there are, um, it's a receder. It's a receder. If you don't like receders, look for sterile varieties that won't recede. I believe, um, no, I don't have that listed, sorry. Okay, lemongrass. So lemongrass just keeps wider and wider and wider. This, this small base will get bigger and bigger and bigger. So if, it's, if you're not using it as a, as a cook, now a cooks will, they only use this first six inches. So if you're using it, your base will stay this but you need to be aware that it does get wider and wider and wider, much like the Mexican mint marigold. So it's a clumping grass. And this, uh, this plant is what produces the lemon scent that we find in citronella, citronella candles. Citronella is not a plant, it's a product derived from this plant. Purple cone flower. I love this. Okay, so there's many varieties of purple cone flower these days. Um, so I can't, or should I say, be sure to follow the plant specifications for the variety you are planting. It's a clumping plant that will get bigger, but will not spread like the mints and the oreganos. They can recede um, to prevent that deadhead if if you want to control it from receding. Scented geraniums. With the uh, scented geraniums, this is it's not a desirable leaf to eat, but to use as a flavoring. Uh, it is said that linen scented geraniums deter insects. Uh, many times you'll see in uh, nurseries They'll call the lemon scented geranium a citronella plant. Um, many use the flavors for drinks and icings and can be used um, uh, to put at the bottom of a cake mix or a cake or with the layers. It will scent as the um, cake cooks, the scent of the geranium leaf will go throughout the they're very pre pretty perennials. And this one here is chocolate. Chocolate scented geranium. Of course. Okay. Ginger. It doesn't need full day of sun. It doesn't need full sun. It prefers some shade. It can grow in containers. If you don't like having to dig it up 
in a bed. It has a clumping growth habit. You harvest, harvest after the four, first four to six months and it emerges in May. So right now there's nothing there. But in May, you'll see these green spikes start to come up. It blooms on a two year rhizome. So if you've just planted ginger, you will not see a um, bloom for two years. Lavender, this is the one everybody has trouble with. So lavender is the famous smelling salts. I, this is something I learned during this program. Um, it's the smelling salts that were popular in Victorian times. Uh, lavender is prone to root rot and needs excellent draining. I mean, it needs excellent draining. It needs excellent draining. It's, it almost doesn't work in the ground. If you, I prefer to grow it in a pot because it just doesn't last in the ground here. There are varieties that out that this is better for Texas. Um, I believe one of them was called Phenomenal. And I've got that one to live a little longer. And a good one, Creek, is another one. I got that one to live a little longer. But um, it, it needs excellent drainage. And it doesn't, our, uh, so our lavender roots like to be crowded in the pot. This allows for less moisture to rot the roots because it, if you put it in too big of a pot, it takes longer for the roots to absorb the moisture from that soil and it'll root rot. So it needs to be crowded with a smaller um, pot, allowing the roots to draw the water out of the soil and to um, prevent root rot. But um, don't water, avoid foliar watering. Mulch is not recommended because it holds in moisture and you don't want to do that. It causes root rot. And uh, it could benefit from a gravel around the plant instead of the mulch. And during our rainy season, if it's in the ground, you want to harvest it from the middles to give it air. So right, right after it rains, you need to go out there and, and trim it to give it air. But, um, uh, or if you throw it in a pot, bring it out of the rain. That will help you keep lavender to live longer. It says that it only lives three to four years, but I have never even seen that happen. I can't. Okay, lemon balm. This is one of my favorite herbs. I love using it in um, teas. It has a beautiful lemon uh, flavor, smell. It's, um, it's like mint. It's in a mint family. Mint will will become um, dormant in the summertime. It just gets too hot in our summers. The only way to keep it alive is to keep it moist, even moisture and shade will help too. But it looks really pretty growing in, in full sun. So if you're gonna continue to grow it in full sun, be sure to keep an even moisture. It makes a nice rounding habit small white flowers on the second year plant. There's the little white flowers. Marjoram. It spreads like, it's a Mediterranean herb and it spreads like oregano. It could also benefit from some shade. And I use it just like I use oregano. It's also, we put this in our, it's in the poultry seasoning. So if you buy a poultry seasoning, it's marjoram, rosemary, sage. Yeah, sage, marjoram, rosemary. That's in, in poultry seasoning. So this was in our poultry seasoning bed. This is Nancy's favorite, Cuban oregano. It's so gorgeous growing. I mean, any variegated plant is gorgeous growing. I love variegated plants, but it smells wonderful. So this plant will not tolerate any cold. I mean, hardly any. We, we love using cuttings of this variegated herb in our tussy mussies. It can use, be used to liven up a bud vase too. In other countries, this herb is not used as an oregano. It is considered a thyme. It has so many different names in other countries 
can't think of one of them, but I know that the, the and I think even in Cuba, it's considered a thyme, but we call it Cuban oregano. Yeah. And it's a succulent. These leaves are very thick. It's considered a succulent. Mexican oregano. There are two Mexican oreganos. I will show you the next one in the next slide. This is my favorite because of the flowers. Uh, the flowers are tubular. Hummingbirds love it. It's just gorgeous. It, and it blooms August through September. And it's a new herb for me. I have been growing it for about three years. There are uh, two varieties. And I'll show you the next one. It's the other Mexican oregano. This one has a totally different growth habit. So um, if you're not continuing to um, shape it and cut it back, the leaves on this plant will grow far apart. But this is the one like I was in a restaurant recently and they had it in a shaker. So this is the one I find most uh, Spanish restaurants using as Mexican oregano, but the other one is just prettier. But this is a very good lemony oregano flavor and it's used in most Tex-Mex recipes. And uh, that's a red, I said that. Okay, Tuscan blue rosemary. This is a really pretty one. It's it's not the most popular um, used in dishes, but it is a it's a great popular one. Um, it has the reason why I like it better than the one that's most popular is a spice island. But this one has more branches. It branches more. It's not just straight erect ones like uh, the Spice Island. But this one uh, has, it's still an upright, but it branches more and the branches are softer. It is a great flavor. I believe the, the one Mary always said, the uh, Spice Island said that um, it has less of a piney flavor. And weeping rosemary. Um, this plant drapes over walls, raised beds, but uh, it's not one of the most favorite and used in culinary reasons, but for aesthetics and um, dramatics, this is really a nice rosemary. Any Lady Blue is what we have growing in the Discovery Garden. And I'm here to tell you, Nancy, it's gonna make it. It looks bad right now, but it's gonna make it. Summer savory. Savory is good in beans. And there's two varieties. I've already spoke about the winter savory and summer savory is actually only annual, but um, it grows very, it grows easily. I think the winter, winter savory grows even easier. It's better, but this is a great herb to have. So I use it in beans and um, a pork dish. A common sage. Uh, this is a Mediterranean herb, and this is one of the herbs um, I kept looking out my back at my herb garden and kept seeing the sage was green and sage was green. I thought, really, that's just an illusion. That's the only thing green in my herb bed, but it did. It made it. Sage made it. Unscathed. Um, it's easily propagated from seed. It needs well draining. It doesn't need um, irrigation. It, you can put it, the, I have an herb bed back there that I don't have any irrigation on. It's, um, it's just, it gets rain when it rains, and I, but I use it. So I go out and cut it. I don't leave, uh, it's open. I don't leave it all compact. So it does help. Herbs are best if you go and cut on them and use them. When they get too full and compact, if you're just using them as aesthetics, sometimes you can have more problems than you would if you were actually cutting and using them. Because it's pro prone to root rot, much like lavender, but it's not as bad as lavender. Um, and this is one you don't want to put a bunch of mulch next to either because it, the um, you don't want to hold the moisture and you want it to be able to dry out in between 
they, I put this one in there because it's just so pretty. It's same herb, same flavors, but it's high color. It's pretty. I love variegated herbs. Stevia, the sweet herb. This is an easy, easy perennial to grow. It, it likes good drainage as well. Um, I like adding it fresh to teas, especially mint teas. I have seen it grow, grow, grow taller than two feet. And the stevia products in the store are highly processed, so it's better to grow your own. Yarrow, this is one that we have in our sale. Colorado mix, so pretty. Yarrow is, grows easily. It doesn't need um, irrigation either. And here's another one that we're gonna have in our sale, the rose colored one. It attracts butterflies and it blooms from summer to fall. And so here I've been speak, speaking about Mediterranean every now and then I would mention it's a Mediterranean herb but here's a list of them, and this is why we feel it's important that you need to know that it's a Mediterranean herb because heavy rains can cause root. Um, information about, have, um, yes, okay. And then, there's one more. Oh yeah, the, um, Sometimes it's best for Mediterranean herbs, instead of using mulches, to use a gravel or a grit around the bed, around the soil of the bed, the beds of the base of the plant. There we go. And here are some of our resources that we use to compile this information. Um, these are great books. And we also will have handouts that will come out with the email and there are any questions, I can answer them. Thank y'all. All right, thank you. We appreciate everyone attending today. We hope to see you at our future seminars. Y'all yeah. have a great weekend.